Hello and welcome to Encore's music show. I'm Mariam Saab, coming up. In the 90s, Lebanon was rising from the ashes of more than 15 years of civil war. It was a heady mix of despair and boredom that drove Beirut-born Yasmin Hamdan to start electro-pop duo Soap Kills and fire up the city's underground music scene. Since her voice has carried far more than a melody, she's become the frontwoman of modern Arabic music and a flag bearer for freedom of expression, thought and sexuality in the Middle East and beyond. Yasmin joins us on set to talk about her latest album, Al Jamilat, Arabic for the Beautiful Ones. Yasmin, welcome to Encore. It's so Hi. nice to have a fellow Lebanese woman here on set. Tell me, what do you miss most about the motherland, we could say? Um, many things. Um, the sun, the good weather, the sea. The sea is really important. And the food. The food family, of course. But then, you know, I visit very often, so I can... You know, I can I can go back and eat well, eat a lot, and then, some uh, kibbu yeah. labne. Yeah, everything, <laughs> everything you want. Now, the motherland, the mother, and the woman. The late Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish, who wrote uh, the, the 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 lyrics for Al Jamilat, your title track, was passionate about those things. He was the voice of resistance, Arab identity, and exile. Tell me, why Al Jamilat? Why this poem? And why Mahmoud Darwish? Well, I love Mahmoud Darwish's work. I've, I've been inspired by him. And also when I read this, um, when I read this poem, I felt that it, it was exactly how I f would uh, per perceive beauty, you know, in its, in its contradictions and imperfections and with tenderness. And his, you know, his, uh, his poem is full of metaphors and colors and it's, it's, it's extremely beautiful. So I was really touched by it and I felt like I wanted to sing it. And in a way, it's complimenting women, you know, all kinds of women in, in their, each, each one in their own, you know, identity you and personality. Can you tell us a, a, one of your favorite lines from, uh, from the... All the of poem? them are beautiful. <laughs> you Can't know, the beautiful ones one. are the beautiful ones. So it's like the shorter, the beautiful ones are the shorter ones, the short ones. The beautiful ones are the taller ones. The beautiful ones are your neighbors. You, the beautiful ones are the ones who are, you know, uh, your far neighbors. The beautiful ones are the princesses. The beautiful ones are the strong ones. The beautiful ones are the more, the fragile ones. So it's really... You know, it's all of them. It feeds into the complexities of womanhood, uh, and that really comes out to play on your album as a whole. In both love and life, tell me, what power do you draw from being an Arab woman, and what are some of the challenges associated with that? Well, first, I, I think that it's a privilege to be an artist today, and, and I, I don't look at myself only as an Arab woman, you know, I live in a wider world and I come from different worlds. I've, I've been living in different environments and, you know, been in contact with different cultures. I do need to have this conversation with my kind of native culture, which is Arabic. And I think that it's important to have it. And it's important that through your art, you can, you know, raise questions and... Um, sometimes propose some answers or some alternatives. And that's, I think, you know, it's, it's um, I was blessed to start kind of early, like late, late 90s with the soap kills. And in a way, start, it, it, it made sense to me to, to sing in Arabic because it was, it was a, um, a very, it was for me a way of expressing my own, you know, femininity, but also, you know, have my own voice and be independent through that. And Arabic music has been a very big influence on me, the old Arabic music. Well, let's get a taste of that now. Let's soak up a little bit of Al Jamilat. This is La Ba'den. <laughs>
beautiful music there. That clip was directed by a very talented Palestinian director, Elia Suleiman, who happens to be your husband. Uh, now, in the song we just heard, you sing in Arabic, you'll say, Nehki fi abadan. We'll talk about it later. I'm curious, do you use this line a lot on Elia, Yasmin? Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I actually do it on everyone. Uh, it's it's always it's a it's a typical uh, form of expression that we have. Like, okay, we'll talk about it later. But it's it's a bit manipulative, but it's also witty and it's it's also fun. So yeah, the song is uh, is more about uh, a com- kind of a conversation between a couple and a woman being manipulative and being you know putting some spices into the relationship. Um, yeah, I do use it. <laughs> On to uh, mainstream Arabic pop today. Some of the big stars are, are celebrated, I think, for you know their plastic, overproduced, uh, hypersexualized personas. But w- when you do something more sensual, more raw and real, uh, you're branded by some people as a provocateur. Do yeah. you think that there's a double standard in in the industry? Yeah, I mean, it's it's just that if you are doing something that. Uh raises some questions or just is kind of enters into something that can be called a subculture or an an alternative if you are just not being just an object and you you can be uh yeah you are you can be judged differently it's harder for for people to accept do you think that's changing depending i mean in the arab world i don't know it's just because they they have a lot of boxes okay it's kind of conservative in a way you have the old like the real arabic authentic music that they call it's very sacred and then you have the pop that is like hobbit like just you know and then you can you don't have things in the middle and i think it's changing now yeah now, you, you got your start in Beirut. Uh, it wasn't easy to make a scene uh, where there was none in the early 90s. I mean, we're talking about electricity cuts, bomb scares, a country picking up the pieces after years of war. Uh, was the point of your early duo, So Kills, with Zaid Hamdan to create something harmonious, to cut above the noise? I think it was more about me having, you know, um, having something to do. And it was more on a personal level. And it was also, I mean, it started like that. I was very bored and I was a bit, you know, alienated by the environment. And I was angry because I had, you know, I'm a post-war generation. So I had so all of those questions and I was, and I had nobody uh, who, who could answer that, those questions. Uh, and I, I, it, it came really out of despair, really. And, and music kind of saved my life. Back then, I started listening to a lot of music, and it, it gave me desires. And that desire, those desires triggered, you know, those things in me. And I start, yeah, we started So Kills. It was, in a way, kind of an accident to improvise everything because nothing was real, ready for us. Um, but then I would say that... Um, uh it's not it's it became really for me like political and more like a social engagement aside from an art project and my own you know self being engaged into art it became more like a fight you come yeah. a, a long way since you're going on a world tour uh, now to support Al Jamilat, playing here in Paris on April 27th at Le Flow. Now that's sold out, but fans can get their second fix of you at your next gig at Le Trianon here in Paris. That's in October. Uh, when you're backstage, uh, what do you do to get into the zone? I heard that you were before playing at a venue in Egypt where uh, the legendary singer Im Kaltoum used to play. You felt that you were channeling her energy. Is that something that you do backstage to kind of get in the role? Mm. It depends how much time you have and, you know, every concert is different. I usually listen to one singer that I really love. Her name is Abida Parveen. She's a Pakistani. And I discovered her when I was in India. And I listen to her because she just calms me down. And then I have a sip of vodka. (laughs) And that's the best, I think. You know, to just put you in a in a good place. A sip of vodka. That sounds. A sip that sounds... of vodka is the best. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bob Dylan, he's channeling channeling the greats on his new triple disc album, Triplicate. It's a personal take on the American classic songbook. 
The singer tops our music news of the week. Bob Dylan's 38th record dropped just as he formally accepted the Nobel Prize for Literature in Stockholm last Saturday. He was seen as a reluctant recipient. The prize was awarded to Dylan in October for creating new poetic expressions within the song tradition. That's according to the Academy. Dylan is the first songwriter to receive the prestigious award. Here's a clip of the first single from Dylan's latest album, Tricklicket, I Could Have Told You. I could have told you She'd hurt you She'd love you a while Then desert you If only you'd asked I could have told you so Also out this week is Father John Misty, a.k.a. Josh Tillerman. He's on his third studio album, Pure Comedy, but it's no laughing matter. The American folk singer delves into the trials and tribulations of humanity, from our dependence on technology to our struggle to coexist with nature. To really drive home his ideas, Tillerman published an 800-word essay about how the possibility of utopia here on Earth has slipped through our fingers. I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. Thank you very much, Yasmin, for joining us on the show, Thank everyone. You. Go out and check out Al Jamilat. We're going to leave you with uh, the latest clip from the Grammy-winning group Kanono No. 1. They hail from Kinshasa. And uh, they're Yasmin's label mates on Crammed Discs. Stick around. There's more news coming up on France 24. This is Yabadi Mama. Take a look. Mm -hmm.